All right, our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Ryan. Uh, Dr. Ryan was the 2017 Mazna Aquarius of the Year Award winner. Uh, he is an associate professor at Roger Williams University where he has an army of undergrads and a big research lab aquaculturing dozens of species. He's published over 50 peer-reviewed articles and today he is going to be talking to us about poisoned reefs, 50 years of cyanide fishing, a failure of science or policy. Let's welcome Andy. Thanks for coming on Sunday morning. Uh, I'll just have to give you a little notice if I fall off the stage, it's because I don't stand still. And I left my adapter to be able to use a remote. So uh, but you, can, you can laugh if I fall off, though. But, uh, so um, I, uh, I have a very, a very large lab um, with a lot of students. And I'm also uh, very spread out in my research topics. They all somehow involve the aquarium trade, and they usually uh, uh, grabbed me in some way that I had not intended, and this is a really interesting story of that. Um, to accomplish this type of work uh, takes quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of teamwork, and uh, on the program it said it titled it, it advanced and it had the word chemistry on there. And I'm a biologist, and I'm not a chemist, and um, I. But I'm fortunate enough that I work with a very good analytical chemist who has entertained my uh, desires to, to answer some of these questions we've asked. And we also have worked with, uh, well, we're up to seven of my either former students or current students uh, working on this project. I have uh, two students here, Alex Bonanno and, and Sarah Hunt, and I'll show you their poster in just a few minutes. But uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about our work, you can talk to them or try to find me and see if you can learn how to talk to me in a way that I'll respond back to you by email or, or something. So um, we've worked on this for about four years and this has been a, a collaboration uh, between us and some other other folks and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute but um, Joss Hill from Olazu is a small international a small international nonprofit originally funded this work um, they were very interested in, in trying to replicate uh, what seemed to be a very promising cyanide test so I, I'm very fortunate. I, I have an amazing lab and a, a, at an amazing place, an amazing collaboration with the New England Aquarium. We run an aquarium science aquaculture program. Uh, my primary mission there is to develop rearing protocols for uh, species that are displayed on public aquariums and also to uh, look at aquarium uh, fisheries and trade issues. Uh, and, and this is, uh, spans a, a wide variety of topics. Um, I, I'm a scientist and I, I have always been uh, very, uh, very focused on science, and I, I really love the process of science. Um, but as you're well aware, the pu and, and some of you may uh, have some of these sentiments, but the public trust in, in the institutions of science really have been under attack for quite some time. And this, this, ta this, this mode of, of attack really has been promoted through industries such as the tobacco industry and, and oil industries to try to see doubt in the public as to how science actually works and the reliability of data. And that's cast quite a bit of doubt. And that's been perpetrated really in, in the ability to control legislation and to control uh, regulations. And so um, the public is rightfully skeptical about the role of science has in technology and health and other products. And, and that's because there's an interesting interplay between science and policy and, and how science works. Uh, and the story I'm about to tell you is going to challenge your, your, your understanding of how science should work and some of the things that have happened and the, the role of NGOs and other scientists into that and my role uh, into this project. But I want you to remember that the old scientific method is the scientific method. There is no such thing as the new scientific method. This is a perpetration that sometimes individual scientists do things or act in certain ways that you might question the institution of science, but that's not, that's not what you should be, should be questioning. The, the most remarkable thing human has ever invented is the scientific method. All the technology, all the health care, everything you use is re rooted in the, the process of science. And so I don't want you to forget that as I go forward. My primary question that I, I ask uh, any time we address any issue in the aquarium trade really is, is sparked by these corals I bought in 1996 uh, from these ladies in the Solomon Islands when I worked at a, uh, at a pet store. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I ordered these. Uh, they came with fishing string on them. And I, I was really interested 
and the, how that happened, like how somebody, the little concrete disc and the fishing string happened. And so there was a couple of articles that showed up in Seascape or Seascope magazine from, from uh, Instant Ocean used to put out. And uh, uh, then Rhett Talbot uh, published this really beautiful photo. And we used this photo as a cover story in a 2012 paper that we published on the aquarium trade and the changes in the trade from primary wild capture over to an aquaculture and mariculture trade. Uh, but this, 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 that purchase of those corals in 1996, 1997 really has always stayed with me and I've always been intrigued about this and this is one of those remarkable stories of, of what uh, the trade can do for uh, conservation. The aquarium trade is a really dispersed uh, distance supply chain. Um, I'm going to show you a more relevant example to everyone's life in this room and, and anyone you know's life, but, but just know that that supply chain is really murky and it's, it doesn't have a lot of transparency in parts of its nodes. We spent a lot of effort and energy studying this. Uh, Cairns Marine has a spectacular graphic that really shows you the challenge here of, of that. And that is that you have really no idea where your fish come from for the most part, unless they come from single source countries where you know where those fish came from, either Fiji or Australia or Hawaii or something, you might be able to get back to the collector. But you still probably cannot get back to the individual that actually collected your fish. And that causes some challenges and that is not unique to the aquarium trade. The best example on how I talk to the general public about this is through, is through your clothes. If you look at the tag on your clothes, it's gonna be made in a country and most likely it's no longer made in the United States. I grew up in a, a furniture and clothing manufacturing area in North Carolina and I watched those industries leave. And that's primarily because people did not want to pay for more expensive clothing or furniture. They wanted to buy things cheaper. And so the price of things tends to impact your supply. But you want to, we want to believe that this person is, is the ideal model of who makes your clothes. She seems like she's pretty happy and well taken care of. The reality is, is that your clothes and your purchase of clothing drive a lot of interesting uh, habits and behaviors of, of the people who run the factories that make clothes. And so your interaction with your purchases and how you buy things directly relate to, to people who supply those. And I want you to remember that as, as we go forward. So data and transparency are really critical to the long-term uh, sustainability and survival of the aquarium trade. Um, I, I've never been to a meeting where I've not run into other scientists who didn't, like myself, became a scientist because they had a fish tank or were interested in, in, uh, in fish in some way. Um, and Charlie Vern's talk last night, I think, was emblematic of that. Here's someone who was working on insects and had a fish tank and, and changed his career to work on corals and really changed the world that we know uh, when it comes to coral taxonomy and coral biology. And that's repeated over and over and over again, whether it's David Bellwood's work with fish. Um, he was a hobbyist before he became a fish ecologist. Um, you know, these stories repeat themselves. And so the aquarium trade is really uh, quite a vibrant place for exploration, but it has really a limited amount of transparency and that's really impacting its long-term viability. And I think that's become very apparent um, in the last couple of years. Uh, and, and you can argue the merits of, of some of those things, but that's just where we are. Uh, this is an example of the supply chain in the north of Bali. I don't expect you to be able to read any of that. But if you look at the noise of those lines, you'll see that there is really no way for you to know where your fish came from if you purchase fish from Indonesia. Right? That's, it's impossible the way that it's set up right now. And that creates some challenges for a consumer because consumers want to believe that that fish that they bought that's alive is healthy and was well taken care of and the fishermen who caught them in the supply chain are, are, are not causing long-term impacts to the ecosystem. Um, I work with a lot of data that started in paper form and this is what most of the data of the trade looks like. It's held in paper boxes in, in warehouses and places around the world. But we've taken that and we've put that uh, in electronic form and we've developed a method to basically provide a little bit of, of, of insight into where the, the fish species come from. It still doesn't tell you how they were collected, but it tells you at least where they're coming from and gives some very valuable information to hobbyists, industry, and also regulators uh, and governments because there was a lot of misunderstanding of, of what was traded, the volumes of what was traded, and those impacts those that trade might have. And this the last 10 years or so have really seen an increase in concern over coral reefs, the health of coral reefs, and, and the role that industries have in, the, in, in that process. And 
And what you're seeing is an increased response in regulatory activity due to that concern. And we've seen uh, uh, source country regulation issues, whether it's uh, total trade bans or um, other, other regulatory issues, and those have been very prominently highlighted here uh, at this meeting. Uh, there's two very prominent uh, activities happening right now, one in Fiji and one in Indonesia that has really impacted the trade. I've noticed that here in the trade show uh, this year. There's a lot less corals than there normally would be, I think, in a, in a normal trade show. Um, and I think that's really gotten a lot of people's attention. Importing countries can also impact the trade. So the United States has certain laws, and so does Europe and, and Canada and other countries. And those all are intermixed with concerns over, over the species that are being traded and the, and the general health of the environment. CITES, the CITES uh, treaty and, and uh, how CITES works is, is kind of a, an international treaty and kind of as an umbrella that kind of uh, looks at that. But these are all in, uh, in play, and they're all in play in a very complicated environment. And the, the insults to the environment that have happened in the last all 30 or 40 years, you know, you can argue what role the aquarium trade has had on those in, the, in that larger scheme, but you're kind of intermixed in that ecosystem and there's not a way to really separate yourself from that. And so you're kind of, you're kind of operating this environment. One really good example of how uh, regulations can impact trade is, is the ban that Florida put forward on the entire genus of lionfish. And that was because of, of two species that are highly invasive in the Atlantic. And so they, without any real public comment or, or legislation, uh, they, through constitutional authority of FWC, basically banned the entire genus. Um, and this is interesting because it, uh, it kind of show, I think it provides a good example of what can happen if, if perhaps maybe people are not as proactive as they could have been about looking at what you keep and how you keep it or how the trade actually operates. Because you can lose control very quickly, and we could go through m many more examples of this. Um, Perhaps the, the, uh, one of the most interesting things that happened a couple years ago was a, was a National Geographic article that um, came out. And I, I deal with a lot of data and a lot of trade data. And so when a paper like this comes out or an article like this comes out, um, I'm inundated with questions from various stakeholder groups because people want to know, is, is that number right? You know, I don't think anyone would argue that the, the use of cyanide to clutch aquarium fish is a horrific uh, way of catching fish. That's not really an arguable point. But the, by, the byline here, up to 90% of saltwater aquarium fish are imported into the United States or caught with cyanide. Um, that got a lot of people really angry in the trade uh, because they felt like they were being attacked unjustly. And that number is really wildly inaccurate. Um, but my, you know, so we, we spent several weeks going through a bunch of data and kind of trying to help people understand where this number came from, how National Geographic considered that article fact-checked but still published that, that number, and then what that number might actually be. And then, the, but the final question really came back to, does it really matter if 10% of the fish in the aquarium trade are caught with cyanide or 90%? What, does the number actually matter? if this practice is still uh, occurring in, in any reasonable large percent, right? And so, um, you know, that really, you know, this, this article really gets it, got people's attention. That, that number is a really large number. And, um, and so the result of, of, of cyanide fishing, whether it's food fish or aquarium fish, is really uh, the, the, not just the impact on the fish that you buy, uh, and then you hold, you'll hear lots of stories from hobbyists about uh, they have had fish and all of a sudden they had them and they look great and then they died. People make the assumption when you buy fish because it's swimming in a tank that you, pay, you bought them from that it's healthy, right? And, and the, the honest reality is, is you don't know how healthy or unhealthy it is uh, for several weeks. And that, that tends to play out in, in the end consumer's uh, tank. But left on the reef or, or in the supply chain is a high rate of mortality due to destructive fishing practices. We have no idea what that rate of mortality is or how destructive it really is. Other than that, we do know that where cyanide fishing has been active, the reefs are heavily degraded and that fishermen are also using other highly destructive techniques, blast fishing for food fish or other, other things. This is all intermixing together, but we do know that the reefs are heavily impacted throughout the Indo-Pacific and they're majorly impacted by fishing methods such as cyanide or, or dynamite fishing. So, um, I was in Honolulu in 2016 at an International Coral Reef Symposium uh, and there was a 
particular paper that we were really interested in, in sitting in on a talk because we've been working in this, this area for about four years and, and um, I sat in on a talk that uh, proclaimed that they had, had replicated a test that we were very interested in working on and had been working on for several years and that, that uh, um, you know, they have, these, these authors, and, and you're going to recognize these names, um, they've become very, very, one of them is particularly famous uh, in the aquarium trade for her stance and, and kind of her activities in Hawaii, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about this. Bruce did a great job, I think, summarizing that the other day. But this was a, I mean, it's sitting in an international meeting, and I'm listening at this, and I'm sitting with a couple other people. Sebastian Fries is there, who's a German scientist who's been also working on this exact same topic for several years. Uh, and we're watching this talk, and this slide comes up, and I was stunned by some of these numbers, right? I was really, really stunned by these numbers. And so um, a couple things go through your mind when you see somebody that may have done something that you've been trying to do for years. Now, I work in aquaculture trying to raise animals that people haven't raised or other people are working on. And so you get pretty used to people raising things you've been trying to work on, and then you try to figure out how they did it so you can repeat it, right? Um, so we were really interested in this, and the thing that really got my attention the most was not that 51% of the fish tested positive, because that might be possible, right? In some manner, it could be, but I have no idea. But what was interesting was this number. Um, I have pretty good friends in Indonesia, and some of them used to fish with cyanide. And they have stopped using cyanide, uh, and, and they have, we've, been, we've maintained contact since about, I started going to Indonesia in about 2010 to help run aquaculture, mariculture coral workshops uh, for, for NOAA and, um, and some other inter international agencies. And um, through that, we, you know, we've been working in, in this little small area called Les Village in the north of Bali. And so these fishermen converted from using cyanide to, to net uh, caught fish around 2003 or so. And it's a really remarkable story of persistence and, and work from a small NGO there and some other people to help train these fishermen. And so it's pretty easy for me to ask people who I know used to use cyanide, and they're very open about it, if things like this are real. And so I was sitting in that talk, and... I sent a message, I, I, uh, you know, I put this on social media because this was striking to me. And I, I sent a message over to Indonesia and I asked, I said, I've never heard of anyone using cyanide to catch green chromis before. It seemed really remarkable to me. Um, again, I didn't know, but I asked, right? And, and they were stunned. I think they were more stunned than I was. Um, and some of the answers that came back was that never heard of that before, which I found quite remarkable because they, I think they would know. Um, and so this really, you know, we were really interested in, in this. And again, my perspective in this meeting was is that here is a group of people who have done something that I've been trying to do for a couple of years. Perhaps we don't know what we're doing and we need to learn from them. And, and that's kind of the role of the, of the position I tend to take on much of what I do. So what we do know about cyanide and cyanide detection came from the International Marine Life Alliance and Peter Rubrik's work of, of, uh, in the Philippines with BFAR. And this is an interesting method that was adopted. It's, it, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's very complicated, but it's a little bit like measuring pH of water. Right? They have an electrode that can sense an ion, and, and the best way I can explain is it just works a lot like your pH meter. And if you've ever used a pH meter, you know that it's not really as simple as that magic number that shows up on that box, right? It's actually very complicated. So they take fish, essentially they put them in a bassomatic, if, you're, uh, if, you like, uh, if, you've, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Saturday Night Live. They blend the fish up. They take, you know, maybe enough to get about 10 grams of tissue, right? Homogenize that tissue is the, the word you use, actually, but it's a blender. Um, they blend it up, and then they basically cook that in an acid solution and then catch that gas that's coming off in a base which holds the cyanide or thiocyanate in there. And they have their, their little meter in there to measure it. Pretty toxic, pretty complicated, uh, and, uh, but it seemed like testing worked. So when they started testing, they got about 40-50% positive results. And then those results went down over time through testing. And that would maybe indicate that testing actually maybe curtailed activity that was happening that, that was illegal. Uh, and so because you're testing, 
people don't do as many illegal things. So uh, it works in lots of ways of your behavior, whether it's you know driving uh, while you're intoxicated or whatever it is. You're, if you're afraid of some enforcement action, you might not do something that's uh, otherwise uh, not good for you. So. This test is very interesting because this test has never been analytically validated that I can uh, that I actually can find out. It was a, it's been approved in the lab, but it's one thing to do something in the lab and, and test it and then move it out to the field. And so, um, but it does appear like testing works in some manner. We just don't know a lot about it. Um, but I think sometimes when you, people have the impression that there's something out there that works, they tend to, um, they tend to. Uh, maybe lose focus of the fact that we don't know everything about it. So this is an interesting graph I put together uh, earlier this year and, and it, lionfish are invasive in the Atlantic and if you look at the amount of research that has been done on lionfish, uh, very little until they became invasive and people in, in the Atlantic seaboard in the Gulf of Mexico, graduate students, became very interested in this. And you have a, a, a huge amount of research happening now on lionfish, right? But if you look at cyanide, you know, you could argue that cyanide fishing is, is, is very destructive. And there's been some research, but if you put these scales on the same, uh, at the same relative proportion, you'll see that there's really been no activity um, at all. Uh, and, and so, which is, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it is a highly toxic substance, and it's a little bit difficult to work with in a lab, but there really hasn't been a lot of work done uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years or so, other than uh, that remarkable work that, that uh, IMA had been trying to do in the Philippines. And so this paper came out uh, in 2012 uh, and it really caught our attention um, because it proposed a method of, of a non-invasive, non-destructive testing method. Basically you put the fish, uh, you, you take your fish that you get and you place it in clean artificial salt water in a jar for 24 hours and then you test the water. And the idea is that uh, cyanide, when it enters um, an organism, is rapidly detoxified by an enzyme that basically takes cyanide and thiosulfate or some type of sulfate um, and moves that over into thiocyanate, which is relatively non-toxic. The best way I can explain this to hobbyists is, is if, if a fish, uh, this, is, this is like ammonia and nitrite when it comes to tox or nitrate rather when it comes to toxicity. Ammonia is very toxic. Nitrate's not so toxic, it can stay in your blood, or nitrite and nit nitrate would be a good, a be probably a better example. So, um, and then this leaves the system fairly quickly. Now this is fairly well understood in mammals, and this is where this diagram comes from as a mammal model, because you can tell that because it has the word urine on there, and so that's how we tend to get rid of things. And so, um, cyanide is, is, is routinely in, uh, in, uh, um, encountered by a few groups of, of people. One is um, first responders of firefighters tend to be uh, suffer cyanide poisoning probably at a higher rate than most, pe most other populations of, of, of affected people because they run into burning buildings and anytime you have a lot of combustion of stuff you get a lot of cyanide generation. And so this is actually a main mode of, 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 uh, of risk for firefighters is cyanide. So we know quite a bit about cyanide in, in in, uh, in mammals, and if, if you smoke or you're out in the casino, you probably are building up some thiocyanate now because you're taking in cyanide from all that wonderful cigarette smoke, and your body is slowly detoxifying it, right? And so non-smokers have less thiocyanate in their blood than smokers or their saliva or your bodily fluids. And um, you also, depending on what you eat, will have some cyanide in it. This pathway is highly conserved. Pretty much every organism has to deal with cyanide in some way. It's very, very, very toxic. And so you see this same enzyme pretty much in every animal. It's pretty almost identical enzyme characteristics. So uh, this paper, uh, you know, uh, proposed that you could find thiocyanate. So this is the amount of thiocyanate in the water. So in that one and a half liter jar that they had their fish in. Uh, this is how much thiocyanate they found, and, and it's in parts per billion, which is a very small number, but it's, it's reasonably uh, detectable at that level. And you can see that they saw it for 28 days, and, but it never showed any, any, um, any signal of going down over that 28-day period. In fact, it was going up. And so, um, and they had two different doses. I want you to keep in, I want you to see these doses and, and, and just remember them. They, they put the fish in 60 seconds of 12 and a half parts per million, and 25 part per million cyanide. 
right? So fish take up cyanide through their gills and also through their gut. Uh, marine fish drink a lot of water. Believe it or not, they drink a tremendous amount of water. And so if you're in a bath of cyanide and you're a marine fish, that cyanide is going to enter your bloodstream through the gills, and then it's also going to enter your bloodstream through your gut, right? And so there's two modes of entry there, but, uh, and then you're going to have to deal with it. And you would expect some dose response. So you give an animal a little bit, and you get a little thiocyanate, and you give an animal a lot, and you get a lot more thiocyanate. You would expect some kind of dose response, right? So if you smoke two packs of cigarettes, you've got so much thiocyanate in your blood. If you smoke, you know, only on Friday night or something like that, you might have the same as a control population, basically. Okay. So... Um, Really remarkable, and we'll come back to this, and, um, and we'll sh I'll, I'll show you some other things that's pretty remarkable about that. So uh, the way you do this is, is, is you essentially just separate the, the compounds that are in that water. Uh, it's very complicated, but at the same time, it's very, very simple. Um, you can do this with Mountain Dew or Purple Kool-Aid or whatever you want to use and you can actually separate out the individual components of any liquid with something called chromatography. And essentially we just pump at really high pressures through a column um, and you have a UV detector that sits on the other side of that column that can see the peak that comes off of that molecule, right? You don't actually get to see what that molecule is. You just know it comes off at a certain time and then you put a standard in there of the same molecule and you correlate those times together. And it's a, this, is a, this is an industry standard method that is used uh, in just about every analytical lab in the world uh, is some type of chromat uh, high performance chromatography, right? It's very advanced methods of doing this and I'll show you some other things we do. But um, we cobbled together some of this equipment to do this. Uh, we happen to, one of the benefits of being at a small uh, university with a, with, that we primar, uh, primary teach in universities, we have lots of cool instruments that have maybe been used for classes or they're older that haven't been used and we can usually put some parts and pieces together and, 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 and build something that's normally pretty expensive. So we got very good at this and we were able to replicate uh, the method to about the exact same level that the, the authors that have proposed this did. Uh, and so we've, Julie and, and Rebecca did this work uh, about three and a half, four years ago. Um, and so uh, then once we got the analytical method worked down, then we had to expose fish to cyanide. Um, and so this is, a, uh, this is a challenging thing to do in a couple fronts. One is, is this is an ethically challenging part of science is to take something that's you know highly toxic and dip an animal into it it's not it's not something that we take lightly but but we you know go through all the ethical procedures of doing this type of animal research we expose fish to cyanide and then uh, you'll notice one of the contrasts that always strikes out to me when I when I talk about this is that I'm geared up in so much personal protective equipment here that I can barely move and you have fishermen with squirt bottles right um, with the same material at much higher concentrations, right? Um, and I, I think that just speaks to the, uh, you know, to the challenges here of working in some of these, these countries. But the reality is, is that the cyanide I have in this bath is at such low concentration that there's really no way I can hurt myself with it unless I drank a liter of salt water. And, you know, the odds of that are very low. I'm not, uh, not Raj. So, uh. so we put the fish in there. Now, now we use... 50 parts per million for 60 seconds because I figured, you know, they use 25. Well, we'll use 50 because it's more and we'll get a better dose response and I can actually see it and then I'll take some things out. So there's fish after you treat them. Um, it is not a pleasant thing to do to an animal. Uh, they basically are paralyzed. I don't think anesthetized is the correct word to use. They are paralyzed. They cannot move for about 22 minutes. Uh, this, this behavior of, of their, them being paralyzed is completely correlated to their dose, right? So the more we give them, they either, if they don't die, just, they just are paralyzed longer. And eventually they come back. The remarkable thing is, is we're really good at this. And um, we rarely have mortalities in the lab. Um, and we, we were very good at controlling that. And so the fish look really wonderful after, after this. And uh, you would not know. If you walked into my lab, you would not know one would be able to tell which fish had been exposed and not been exposed after three days. They would eat, they would behave normally and everything. So you have, we have no idea, we would have no idea unless it was marked on the, on the, on the container. So uh, we did this for about three years. Now, and the reality is, is we teach a lot in the fall and spring semesters. So we did this in the summer and we did this in January for about three years. And 
you can really break a student who's been told their whole life that science works uh, when you try to do things that doesn't work uh, for three years with them. Um, and, but luckily we have very resilient students and so um, Julie and Rebecca are both in graduate school um, and so they seem better for it. Uh, and we, we've, uh, and some of the other students have worked, we've, we've gotten somewhere, so they, they, they're a little bit more confident in what they can do. But um, just, uh, you know, when we published a paper, this isn't a paper, and so if you're really interested in you can read it, but the story is, is that we never got any results. Now, again, I'm sitting in Hawaii at this meeting, and we can't do this. Now, Nancy and I are wondering, we're talking to each other, maybe we don't know what we're doing, which is honestly very relevant. I mean, we can't raise blue tangs, but Matt and Liz can, right? So. I mean, something's wrong with my techniques, right? And so we asked lots of questions and tried to get at that. One of the things we did, though, is we found some better chemists and, um, who had a better lab, actually. I don't know if they're better chemists, but uh, Nancy's quite spectacular. But we found a lab that has, uh, does a lot of drug testing uh, because of opioid problems and, and pain management, and they have 75 next-generation uh, Ultra HPLC mass specs in their building, which is insane. Uh, and they also have a director of research who's allowed to do things like help us. And so we have one of the a leading expert in, in, in this type of next generation technology. Uh, and we um, replicated a method that was published uh, and we kind of optimized it for salt water. And we got our detection limit a lot lower than you could, could with the other method. And the other thing is, is we know exactly the compound we have now. So I told you that you don't know what you're looking at with UV. Viz, right? You have no idea. You just put a standard in there and you see the peak at the same time and you're like, okay, it's the same compound. Um, and it's a, that's a valid thing to do. But this is kind of the gold standard. So we labeled cyanide with a, what's called a stable isotope. It had a heavier carbon than you normally use. And so because of that, we knew we were looking for C13 in the thiocyanate, which we basically coupled with another compound. This is similar to if you did an ammonia test. Y'all test, how many people test water? Ammonia, nitrite, calcium, right? Or ammonia, nitrite. Well, you're bonding compounds together and you're making color changes. This is pretty much the same thing. And then we basically read the mass of this and, and we do some other very, uh, very sophisticated things. But the point is, is that we can detect very low levels. I mean, well below one part per billion. And we also know what we're looking at now. And uh, we never saw anything again. Um, and so now we're really wondering what's going on. And so, uh, so I love science, uh, I really do, and, but it's very frustrating when you get nothing, right? You get absolutely nothing for four years. And uh, so, um, you know, and you really have to ask, do you have nothing or do you have something, right? And so Nancy's, uh, and this is, Rhett Talbot covered this quite a bit in an article he wrote recently. Nancy was driving to pick up her daughter in college and, and was doing some math in her head. Uh, and because we were really, really interested in what was happening. So I'm going to show you the math behind this really quickly, just very lightly. But um, their average recovery was 5.7 parts per billion over 28 days. That means they got about 239 micrograms of thiocyanate out of a fish. Now, is that a lot? That's why I have an elephant on the beginning of my talk. Is that a lot? Depends on who you are, right? And so. Uh, um, so, you know, that's, a, that's quite a bit, um, but is a, that, that ends up being 107 micrograms of cyanide. Now, if I came over and gave you all 107 micrograms of cyanide, you wouldn't know it, right? Uh, you probably get that when you're smoking a cigarette or, or whatever, right? So you would not, you would not, that would not register in your body at very high levels because you're fairly large, right? Like our friend the elephant here. Um, and so the fish is uh, the fish they use were about two grams. And so if you do that math, you end up with something very interesting. And this was really shocking to us. So the dose that you, you, you have to convert the weight of the fish and the amount you gave them to something called dose. And if you, any of you take medication, there's a dose that you're taking and that's based on how much you weigh and the medication you take. This is the same calculation. And so uh, if you calculate the dose of this, you get uh, doses that are so high, I had to use a logarithmic scale to show it to you, but they're off the realm of possibility really for anything we know about any normal animal uh, for being toxic, right? And because David Bellwood was a hobbyist and he was really interested in cyanide in 1981, he exposed fish to radioactive cyanide and published it in FAMA. 
And so I tracked that data down and, and contacted him and asked him about work he did 35 years ago in very specific ways that challenged one's memory. But uh, he was extremely helpful and helped us out enough to where we could calculate somewhat of a reliable dose of what he gave. Now, he only tested three fish or so with that, right? And so this is a huge range of what this could be. But that's about what he got when he basically anesthetized those fish after exposing them to cyanide or paralyzed them. So this is some range of possibility, but this is where this data is. And so um, we published a paper on this, and we really challenged those authors' um, conclusions because it's really not in the realm of possibility. And so uh, I also um, sent the manuscript to the original author of the, of the National Geographic paper. Uh, because I felt like National Geographic needed to correct the record on this um, because they, in a very public way, basically said that, you know, this was something that was happening when it, it's not really possible. It's not that cyanide is not an issue. I don't want anyone in this room to think that cyanide fishing is not a huge an, uh, issue in the aquarium industry. It is. Right? We just don't know how much of an issue or where it's an issue. But we do know it still happens. There's plenty of, plenty of reports that come in of, of, of cyanide fishing still occurring. And there's good work of people trying to re reduce the amount of cyanide fishing. So we moved forward because we actually understood what was happening was, was not our fault, but was something else happening. So we, we, through some frustration, decided we'd start bleeding fish um, and to see if we could actually find it. And it turns out we can. And we, we're, we're fairly good at it now. And um, you can learn more about that if you run into Alex and Sarah. Um, and so they have a poster just over there. Uh, and uh, and you, can, you can talk to them or me about it. And we actually show you a lot of information here that's coming out. We'll, we'll be submitting this here pretty soon. Uh, we're very open about the type of work we do. And so you can usually get data out of me well before we publish it. Um, but this is, uh, this is very interesting, and we have much more data coming down the line. We've exposed more fish than just our friend Nemo here. Um, and uh, I'm not going to tell you the answers of, of, of where we're at with that. But we're making real progress, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think we, we, can, we can definitely answer some questions. Uh, I started this in 2008 looking at a molecular test to, uh, to detect whether cyanide fishing could, you could actually see it in the expression of genes because it's really disruptive. Uh, cyanide is very disruptive to the, to the organism. They have to repair a lot of tissues and things and that will turn a lot of genes on. Um, I gave that up after that 2012 paper came out because we didn't have a lot of resources and it didn't seem like it was that interesting anymore. And we've just recently picked that back up with Mystic Aquarium and Paula Anderson's group. Uh, and that's what Sarah's going to do for her senior thesis. She's going to do amazing work for her senior thesis. And this is part of that. Um, we actually see quite remarkable gene expression uh, from this, in, from this uh, gene that controls that enzyme to detoxify cyanide. And so uh, that, that has a lot of pro promise. Um, and this is very preliminary data. It's not replicated enough to where it needs to be because it's very expensive and time consuming to do this, but we are doing this and it will happen over the next couple months. We'll have, we'll have that done and we'll be making, making more progress with that. But it's, it's, at least we can start understanding what's happening. And so, uh, you know, aquariums are a gateway to science. Uh, the industry has provided so much valuable information uh, that, that informs scientists' work with corals or whatever it might be. And, and, and there is real value to conservation efforts through people's understanding of how science works and also through the trade supply chain, as long as that supply chain is not destructive. And uh, little penguins for anyone who's interested. And uh, I'll take any questions you might have.